Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, A Stronger Funnel, Growing and Leveraging Marketing Equity to Improve MSP Marketing ROI. I'm Amber Noble, a Marketing Specialist at Barracuda MSP, and I'm happy to be moderating today's session. Today, I'm joined by Mark Feigart, founder of Digit. As an accomplished leader in the technology service and solutions field, he has worked to fix the funnel over the last 15 years. During today's educational webinar, Mark will show us his unique perspective on how equity, not ROI, is imperative to sustainable marketing programs. Before we get started, some brief housekeeping. During the webinar, if you have questions, feel free to share them using the questions or chat panel to the right of the Zoom webinar screen. At the conclusion of the webinar, you'll be prompted to complete a brief polling survey. Please take a moment to tell us what you think so we can continually improve the content and quality of our online events. There will also be surveys throughout the presentation if you could also take part in those. Now, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Mark to begin today's presentation. Take it away, Mark. All right. Thanks, Amber. You hear me okay? Yep, I hear you good. All right. Well, um, you know, as Amber stated, I've been doing this funnel thing now for quite a while. And having started uh, my agency, Digit, about 18 years ago now, um, I've been an agency owner most of my career. And like all of us, I'm still learning. But I've had a lot of conversations over the years, and one of them in particular has seemed to repeat itself. And it's the inspiration behind the topic of marketing equity. So when Digit first started out back in 2001, we were building websites on content management systems back when few small and medium-sized businesses really knew what they were. It afforded Digit a great advantage uh, to be able to go in and demo to a marketing professional or business owner how a website worked when you could actually log into the site and make changes and click a save button and see those changes immediately reflected on the website. That was a little radical at the time. Um, but over time, that advantage of being early to market disappeared. And I think we were probably four or five years into it when tools like .NET, Nuke, and Drupal uh, were coming onto the stage. And then a little bit later, uh, when WordPress really started hitting its stride as a full-fledged content management system. So I wanted to move us beyond building websites toward the marketing services. Most of the websites we had delivered prior to then had just sat there after we had walked away um, through degradation of the technology and overall lack of attention. The value of those websites tended to decrease substantially. So fast forward and maybe for the past eight years now, we've invested in developing and refining our capabilities around um, developing and executing successful marketing programs for our clients. But back to those conversations I referenced a minute ago. So I've heard from decision makers so many times a story something like this. We spent thousands of dollars last year and we hired and fired two different agencies and I still don't feel like we have anything to show for it. Or if they didn't say that exactly, they would, that, would, that would be my perception based on the facts learned through the conversation. So... I've thought long and hard about this, and I've tried to bake into Digit's process some level of certainty that we don't find ourselves as an agency in that same situation with a client. It takes me back to a story that I tell. When I was a kid and my brother and I were loading up the back of my dad's 1964 Plymouth Fury with equipment, we're getting ready to go on a family, a family camping trip. And I could, I could hear my dad who was in the house through the screen door, he was looking for garbage bags and he kind of boasted to my mom when he said, yep, we're going to leave the campsite better than we find it. And then my mom shoots back, well, why don't you leave it better than you find it? And it was in that moment, something engaged in my brain. I was, I was compelled by the idea of leaving it better than you find it. And that weekend, I actually put the idea into practice. So at the campsite, I would look around and if I saw a little piece of trash, I would pick it up and put it in one of those garbage bags that my dad had brought with us. Just think, I said to myself at the time, you know, if everybody adopted that mindset. And so to imagine 
that I might work with a client for a few years and then have the client be no better off than when we found them. Well, that to me would be completely unacceptable. So not only do I want to ensure that Digit is leaving clients better than we found them, I also want to empower decision makers to avoid a similar situation themselves when they enter into relationships with agencies or when they undertake a marketing effort internally. In other words, eliminate the bulk of waste that we see today in marketing. So what I'm presenting is a framework for at least understanding where that waste comes from, if not a roadmap for getting rid of waste and improving ROI. So why do we conduct business? Most fundamentally, businesses exist to create and distribute value to customers in exchange for some form of payment. What is that value? Well, that's open for interpretation. And indeed, it is interpreted in many different ways. Um, this is a, a diagram called B2B Elements of Value that's put out, that was put out by Bain Consulting Group, I think a couple of years ago, identifying a hierarchy of needs that a product or service may satisfy. So this is kind of analogous to Maslow's hierarchy, if you're familiar with it. These are the reasons that buyers decide to buy. And a, and a transaction may satisfy any combination of these needs. So starting at the very bottom are foundational elements. Table stakes is what Bain calls them. So if a purchase doesn't satisfy all of these, then the transaction probably will not happen. Um, that could be meeting some sort of product specifications or having an acceptable price, being compliant with government regulations or meeting fundamental ethical standards. And moving further up the value hierarchy is functional value. Does it increase revenue? Does it reduce cost? Um, does it, uh, on the performance side, is the quality um, superior? Does it scale? And all the way up at the top of the ladder is what Bain refers to as inspirational value. So does it help instill or refine or strengthen my vision as a company leader? Does it offer hope to me or my organization? Does it allow me to claim some sort of social responsibility, which I might do, for example, if I bought a pair of shoes from Tom's, knowing that half of that amount that I spend is going to go to some charitable cause? So we know that value takes many forms, but how do we measure it? Or more accurately, how do we measure our success in transferring or distributing that value? Well, you could measure based on profits, and that's okay, but it's not necessarily a long-term indicator um, of our success. But often we use two ways to measure. The first is market share. How many people or organizations are we distributing value to? The second is customer satisfaction. That's a more long-term indicator of success because it's a major factor influencing whether they'll buy from us again. So how about the purpose of marketing? I think that it's almost identical to the purpose of business to create and distribute value, but we're not asking for payment. When we conduct marketing activities, what we're asking for is a customer or prospect or a, a prospect's attention and trust. Not money, but attention and trust. Oops, there's my diagram. Once again, we can explore the elements of value and how it might relate to marketing. We can imagine that when we're marketing our products and services, there are some of these elements that we could be transferring through our marketing activity. What if, for example, and let's target the top of the pyramid, what if you could write an email to a prospect that was so inspirational that your prospect were to change his or her behavior? So using the ideas from this diagram, I bet we could generate countless examples of how we might transfer value through our marketing, all in pursuit of our audience's attention and trust. And how do we measure our success in distributing value through marketing? Why well, are you going to recognize this? Because it's similar to how we measure the success of, of the business as a whole. But when we're talking about marketing, our vocabulary changes slightly. We don't call it market share. 
but rather use the term reach. And in marketing, we generally talk about the satisfaction of our prospect or customers in relation to our marketing initiatives as reputation. And then the value of reach and reputation combined is what we call brand equity. But here's the deal. Brand equity is an outcome. By outcome, I'm, I mean that it's not under our direct control. We can impact brand equity through our marketing activities, but we don't control it. It's an outcome because brand equity is at the whim of the individuals comprising the marketplace. So how do we use marketing to influence brand equity? And Amber, I think you've got a poll that, that you could put, uh, put up right here. Yep, I do. So I'm going to just go ahead and launch that. Let me just make sure I have the right one. I'll just leave it up for a, uh, a few more seconds. Okay. Okay. And uh, Mark, I don't know if you can see the results. Can you see the results that I just shared? I can. I can. Thank you. Um, okay. Very good. Very good. So um, that's good. Um, we've got a, a number of folks that are satisfied with results. And um, I will have to say that that is not exactly what I expected to see. But nevertheless, it's, it's positive. But let me just move on and say that we can impact brand equity fundamentally through the marketing practices in which we engage. So my labels could be different than yours, but this just represents how we've structured our operations at Digit. They, they do represent a broad view of marketing activity overall. And if these labels don't make complete sense to you now, their meanings may become more apparent as we continue. These practices exist to influence brand equity, but there's a layer in between, one which unfortunately is underrepresented in marketing conversations, which tend to be dominated by talk of reach, reputation or these practices that we conduct in order to influence that brand equity. The outputs, it turns out, are the middleware. These are the deliverables and artifacts produced and leveraged through practices aimed at increasing brand equity. So let's organize outputs into four buckets that reflect the four practices. So starting at the bottom left there, um, through enablement, if you move straight up from that, um, we create what we call a digital experience platform. Through the practice of authoring and production, moving to the right, we create quality content. Through syndication of that content, we grow our online presence. And then through analysis and optimization, we develop insights and we squeeze out better performance for our marketing initiatives. These outputs are the perfect segue into the concept of marketing equity. Marketing equity is the net value, both quantitative and qualitative, of a brand's marketing outputs both the deliverables and the artifacts at a single point in time. So let's go into a little bit more detail around what these outputs look like by illustrating some examples. 
A digital experience platform comes from having done our strategy work, which might include helping a client with its positioning, its messaging, or its packaging and pricing. We've completed a design process, so we have a logo and a style guide. Um, our infrastructure has been designed and built out, including a website with content management capabilities, probably a marketing automation platform, and tools for data gathering, analysis, and reporting. Moving to the next bucket in outputs, content refers to the copy, the photography, graphics, and so on. In the next category, presence is created through the practice of syndication. We're going to deploy some of our content on the web such that it will eventually be indexed in search engines. We'll post to social media. Uh, we may deploy online advertising. All these combined will build our presence online. And finally, in the last category of output, which, which stems from the practice of analysis and optimization, we'll be refining our buyer journey maps and our per buyer personas. We're going to be analyzing results from testing and experimentation, and we're going to use the insights gained to, among other things, improve our search engine ranking over time. So though the, though the, through the practices in which we engage, we produce these outputs, and we're able to leverage them to influence brand equity. So when we talk about marketing equity, and I'm, I'm separating that from brand equity because marketing equity in my mind is what we, what we can control. So let's compare two different situations. One firm, firm A, has a great deal of marketing equity. The firm on the right, firm B, has only half as much. So in order for firm B to compensate for that deficit in equity, it will have to invest more in a marketing initiative if it expects to have the same impact that firm A might have on a similar initiative. So all other factors being equal, a firm with less marketing equity must inject more investment into marketing in a given period to have the same impact. Marketing is complicated, especially in an ever-changing digital landscape and especially for IT service providers who are selling products and services that change constantly. But to me, it doesn't explain why I find more often than not that my customers haven't done a good job of guarding and growing marketing equity. So what are we doing wrong? And Amber, could you show another poll here, the second poll? Absolutely. Okay, great. So, so we do have um, some uh, a, main, a minority that use an asset management system, but the vast majority do not. And by the way, I'm not selling digital asset management systems here, so um, so have no fear. But I, I think this may be indicative of of what I do see, and I'm going to continue now. It turns out that we're omitting an important practice in these discussions. Unfortunately, it's, it's been omitted not only from my presentation up to this point, but it's generally omitted from too many marketing conversations that I've witnessed over the years. It's surprising to me that this hasn't become a more important component of our marketing conversations. So DPM refers to digital program management, which is the glue that identifies and organizes digital marketing equity. It's the persistent attention and effort toward the cultiv cultivation of even more equity. So there's a lot of activity covered by digital program management. There's application of a methodology, some marketing methodology. There's project management, knowledge management, um, digital asset management. There's that dis digital asset management system that I referred to in the poll. 
but and and then for an agency like ours it's also account management because we're maintaining close contact with with multiple clients to be able to effectively manage marketing programs across all of them these three outputs of digital project management are in my opinion um, the most important first is what we refer to at digit as the client marketing book it's where we aggregate many of the artifacts from other practice areas like the buyer journey maps and buyer personas at digit we like to say that if our strategy isn't documented we don't have a strategy so we make sure that we have documentation here as a useful reference the same goes for brand messaging it's critical when we go out to develop new campaigns that we can refer to messaging that we've determined through previous efforts um, that will help us maintain consistency. So there's often a narrative that goes along with design and some of it may be in the form of a style guide. Some may describe decisions that have impacted our brand design. So I like to see in one place an inventory of tools that might include the content management system, maybe the CRM, the, the automation platform and others. It's typical that we may have eight or 10 or even 20 different tools that we're leveraging as part of an overall marketing program. So it's important not only that the tools are listed, but that there's some description around how they're used and who owns the accounts or who's responsible for them. If I had a dollar for every time that I or my staff had to spend valuable time chasing down information needed to log into a given account, I think I could retire. And the same goes for social media profiles. So moving on, roles and responsibilities. Uh, if you have subject matter experts on whom you are dependent to help produce content, for example, that needs to be documented somewhere. And not just anywhere, but preferably in one location. There are infinite ways you can go about creating a marketing book. But what's important is that you have an accessible, centralized source for this information. Um, processes, you're going to have some sort of agreed uh, upon approach, for example, to conducting email campaigns. Mm -hmm. What happens if the person responsible for that moves on, whether it's an internal person or someone at an agency that you're using? If there's no documentation, there's a good chance that at some point you're, you're going to experience a hiccup when there's staff turnover. The last item on the list, the marketing journal is an ongoing record that documents activities of any significance, uh, any decisions made and results of those activities and decisions. So this inf information can be referenced um, in the form of a timeline to help provide context and clarity around why certain things were done. If you've got somebody new coming in responsible for improving the performance of a campaign, it's helpful for them to understand what's worked before and what hasn't. And I don't know how you do this if you're not documenting what's happening along the way. So moving over to the second column, um, a digital asset library is where we can house copy, photography, graphics, video, audio, any sort of digital derivatives of that. So white papers, for example, or podcast episodes. You want all of this in a single place, a single library that's searchable so that when a marketing team creates a new campaign, they have a comprehensive view into what is available from which to source content. The last column, um, it's what I call, it's what I call three W it, it refers to the three ways. And if you, if you not, if you're not familiar with it, that it's a set of principles that was introduced in a book called the Phoenix project, which some of you may be familiar with. It's written in the form of a novel, but it basically describes the philosophy of DevOps. So the three ways start with increasing velocity of work toward delivery to the customer. So imagine the marketing value stream and that the fast and, and the faster we can move work through that value stream, the better. Um, likewise, in the second way, we're interested in feedback loops along each step of that value stream. And the third way directly addresses the idea of institutional knowledge supported through continuous testing and experimentation. Mm -hmm. So an example of institutional knowledge created through this practice might be insights related to your target audience or audience groups. Those insights will ultimately be reflected in the documentation that resides in the marketing book. So that's digital program management in a nutshell. So I encourage marketers to adopt a marketing equity mindset, which comes down to three things. 
Number one, stop obsessing over what you can't control and begin obsessing over what you can. We don't control outcomes. Prospects make the decision whether or not to become customers. We don't decide for them. And likewise, we don't make the decision for a prospect to consume our content. If we're fortunate enough to have a prospect on an email list, we can hope they'll open an email, but we don't control our reach. We can influence, though, through the quality of the content that we produce, where we choose, where we choose to syndicate that content and how well we interpret the behavior of our audience through experimentation and analysis. Don't obsess over what you can't control, but do ob obsess over what you can, and you can control your outputs. Number two, use the equity framework as a canvas to evaluate your output and reallocate your marketing efforts accordingly. I mean, this is ultimately a very simple way of looking at, at marketing as a whole. Let me get a sheet of paper and refer back to this deck, which I'll be happy to share with you. Um, write down the categories that I've laid out or, or determine your own categories if you prefer. And write down an inventory of your outputs. Write down to what you don't have. But don't spend time documenting or obsessing over the outcomes. It's, it's not going to help you here to compare your market share, for example, to your competitors. If you want to increase your market share, then consider the outputs that you've produced in order to reach it, to, 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 to do that, to accomplish that, and, and how to improve upon it. Number three, evaluate your current or prospective marketing service providers through that same lens. Use the marketing framework to help guide discussions such that you don't find yourself in the situation where you're a year down the road firing an agency or, or some uh, outside consultant and feeling as though you wasted significant budget because you don't have outputs that you can leverage going forward. Brand equity is still the holy grail of marketing, but it's not within our control. It's an outcome. Marketing equity, on the other hand, um, is an output, and we can control that. So focus on what you can control. Focus on the outputs. Real quickly, um, I see I've forgotten a date. That webinar should, be, um, should have a date of August the 15th on it, but I'm doing a webinar in conjunction with PT Services Group. August 15th, and there's a, a link there if you can jot that down, or again, feel free to request the deck from me. And then I'll be speaking um, at Spice World uh, in September on personal branding for the IT services professional. Um, so I think that's it. Amber, you want to open it up for questions?